Hey everyone, today we are looking at the Roland JV1080, also known as the Super JV PCM based synthesizer module. Roland released this module in 1994 and was really one of the flagship modules at the time. It really improved upon their previous synthesizer modules based on the JV series of synthesis. I purchased this a few months ago on eBay as actually a non working unit. Uh, well, it worked, but the audio outputs, the, there's got three sets of audio outputs in the back that you can send specific parts uh, through specific outputs. And it was claimed it's not working, but sure enough, upon bringing it home and, and actually testing it, it works. There's nothing wrong with it. So while I was hoping this video to be a repair video, I'm just going to make a kind of a, a quick teardown looking inside. This JV1080 is very closely tied to the Roland XP50. They have basically the same sound engine between the two. Although internals are different, they don't use the same boards or anything like that. So I'll be curious to take a look and see what inside here as far as the, the DAX and other um, internal processors is shared between this and the XP50. When this came out in 1984, it was really one of Roland's flagship modules, modules and it's really held up in time to this day. It was probably one of the most popular PCM-based synthesizer modules Roland ever produced. I mean, they sold probably millions of these things. They were used in pretty much every studio everywhere for years. It was really just kind of a standard item that everyone had. Um, out of the box, it had tons of sounds, and then you could, of course, expand it with the, the JV expansion modules. This synth could handle four. Uh, at one point, it had three in there. It had the Pop World and Orchestra modules. I know for a fact that inside this unit, the seller had pulled them and sold them separately before selling, which is fine. It keeps the cost low, which is good. Um, like I said, this unit is fully functional for me, so I don't need to do a repair on it. But we will take a look around inside and discuss some things that, that could potentially go wrong. These are generally extremely reliable units. Very, very little can go wrong with them over time. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that too, but they usually don't show up that often broken. So when I saw one, I, I jumped on it because I thought it would be make kind of an interesting video to take a look at. So with this synth, it is kind of one of my favorite synths of all time, specifically just for its visual appearance. I don't know if Roland was just making items to whatever, you know, equipment to their standard and the way they want it to look, or if they had some type of industrial designer actually designing this stuff. but. I feel that this is probably one of the most beautiful rolling pieces of gear you can get. It's just very, very sleek looking. It's it's very you know, modern looking to this day. Uh, the display is one of the most beautiful displays I've ever seen in my life. Another inverted display, uh, like I talk about so often that I enjoy. Uh, my JV80 has one similar. This one's kind of a, a unique bluish greenish color to it that I've never seen on any other rolling gear. Uh, so the display is very cool. It's one of my favorite parts about the synth. Uh, other than that, overall condition is pretty good on this. It's got some issues. There's a ding here. Uh, the buttons have some wear on the front. Looks like from being scratched up on something. A couple minor little scratches, but overall it's 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 in really good condition, which is makes me happy. Uh, I'll clean it up a little bit, see if I can get some of the scratches off the buttons, but uh, besides that, it is in really good shape. The back of it is pretty basic. You've got a standard AC power cable, which is nice. It's not the Roland proprietary connector. You've got your typical MIDI in, out, through. And then you've got three sets of outputs. You've got your mix out for basically all the different parts. And then you have two assignable parts, or two assignable outputs as well that you can assign to various parts. And these were, were claiming on the, on the listing that weren't working, uh, but they do work. You just have to go into performance mode, uh, pick your parts, and then select the outputs for those parts. And I'm getting full audio out of both of those. So it is fully functional. Kind of a quick look at history of this module. So I've got the Roland 1997 uh, keyboard catalog, which had all of their synths, uh, professional synths, in 1997. And you can see in it that in 97, the JV2080, the next, the successor to the 1080, had just come out. Um, it was the the newest module they had listed, but they were still selling the JV1080. So that was in 1997. I'm not sure how long they continued to make the JV1080 for and sell it, but uh, that would be at least a three-year run, which was pretty good for uh, this synth here. And again, you can find these synths on eBay all the, all day long. Uh, good condition ones typically go between two and three hundred dollars. Sometimes you can find them a little bit cheaper if they've been, you know, hauled around and beat up a little bit, or just the fluke auction ends a little bit cheaper. But uh, they are plentiful available any given time. There's always at least you know five or ten for sale. 
So powering down, you can see that lovely display that's on the front, the kind of unique color to it. Um, I'm not going to go too much in the detail of its function or how to use it or any other features of it. I mean, there's plenty of videos that do that. And the for rolling gear, at least, the manual for this JB1080 is pretty straightforward. Some of the rolling manuals are <laughs> questionable at best. But the, the manual for this unit is, is very clear. And this is a very easy-to-use module, which is really nice. Uh, the encoder on here works, too, without issue. A lot of times you'll see the encoders go bad, but that's an easy thing to replace if yours does go bad. So we will take it apart. Get inside, it's pretty easy. There's a handful of screws near the side and a couple along the back. The ones on the side actually have this little bit larger plate here for reinforcement when you're racking on it, which is nice. It prevents you from you know putting extra stress in those rack gears. All right, all the screws are removed. So lifting the cover off, we can take our first looks inside. We we'll see right off the bat, um, everything's kind of hidden by this top expansion board for the unit which we will remove to look underneath, because that's really what's interesting. Uh, power supply, pretty much the same power supply you see in all rolling gear. Uh, straight up linear power supply. A little bit bigger, a little bit more spread out, nice heat sinking. Uh, we'll look at that closer. Same power transformer you see basically in every piece of rolling gear ever made. We'll talk about that. And then in the back here you can't see is the actual jack board for all the inputs and outputs. We'll first take a look at the power supply here. So pretty basic supply, same overall configuration you see in a lot of rolling gear. Uh, you have your input filtering, in this case a single mov and a choke. And then it goes through your power switch uh, to your primary and the transformer. Now this transformer is the same multi-tap that you see on pretty much all rolling gear. I've talked about this before. I've got a JV80 video that shows how to uh, basically convert voltages on any, any rolling gear. And this follows the same uh, rule here. So on your tap off the hot wire here, um, for instance, if this were a Japanese model, model, it would be tied to the 100 volt tap. So if you want to make it a US model, you move that to the 120 volt tap. Or if you want it European, you know, move it to 240. And that will, you know, correctly adjust the windings on the primary so the secondary has the correct voltages coming off of the unit. So these are really, really easy to modify for other regions if you happen to buy one from Japan or need to convert it to another country. So, secondary transformer goes back to the power supply, and from there you've got a uh, big, nice big, beefy um, bridge rectifier mounted to this piece of metal here, which is actually cool because the heat sink on this piece goes back to the chassis. So, all that heat is you know being dissipated somewhat by the, the rear chassis there, which is nice. These typically don't run that hot, so it's not that big of a deal, but it is a nice touch. Um, regulators, you've got three. You've got your 5 volt regulator there. It's a Sanyo module. I can't see the exact model number. And then you have your pair of plus and minus 12 volt uh, regulators for all your analog circuitry. Uh, those are 7812, 7912s. Capacitors in here are Sanyo branded, uh, 85C rated. Nothing special, but uh, most rolling gear I've looked at, I have never really come across any leaky capacitors. Again, it all depends on the use of them, you know, among other things. But if you have a unit that's been on for, you know, 24 7 for, you know, in this case, almost. 25 years, you know, it was very good possibility that those could be leaking or, or be going bad at that point. So if you were looking to, you know, restore one of these, especially one that had heavier use, um, I would go ahead and replace all the capacitors in the power supply. You know, there's seven total. So it's even getting good, you know, Panasonic or Nishicon or Nippon Chemicon or Rubicon or whoever your favorite capacitor, you know, manufacturer is to replace all those with 105 seat graded, you know, great caps. You're talking, you know, 10, 12, 15 dollars tops. So relatively easy uh, upgrade if if you have a unit that's got a lot of hours on it that you believe and that's really it for the power supply so now we'll look over at the main board so here's a look at the main board on the jv 1080 uh, some interesting things going on comparing it to the xp50 which is really similar architecture to this one uh, we'll kind of start on the right and work way over the left so on the right here you've got your waveform roms in this case there's four of them um, I forget how much memory built in the base unit has, the JB1080. I want to say it was possibly 12 or 16 megs. These might be 4 meg ROMs in the case of 16. I'd have to look that up to see it. Uh, next to that, you got your primary Roland DSP uh, along with the, the RAM to, to you know, make that work. Usually the RAM is there for your you know, onboard effects, delays, uh, reverb, things like this. And these Roland part numbers are very, very proprietary. You can try finding information online you know, 
for the part number for these chips that are branded Roland, but you're not going to have very much luck finding really any information about it. Um, they've really been kept pretty much secret. Minus a couple uh, preferred chips that you see a lot of times in these units, you're not going to find very much information. So moving down here, you've got another Roland branded chip. This is tied into the front panel here for the uh, flash memory cards. So it's probably some type of, of uh, I.O. device for those. Um, on the board, we have a pair of crystals. There is a 24.576 megahertz crystal there, and then over here, another 20 megahertz crystal. Now, one chip that is omitted from this compared to the JV80 will be the chips specifically for the um, keybed, the keyboard and the keybed functions. So you have your velocity detection along with your keybed decoding, and those are typically found right next to you know where the ribbon cables come in from the keybed are. Um, since it's obviously a rack unit, doesn't have that, so you don't see those chips in this board. So the main processor in this unit is this chip down here, and it is an HD six four three seven zero three C one two. That chip looks familiar in terms of other gear I've worked on. Uh, it runs off this twenty megahertz clock sitting right next to it, and I believe it's actually a Hitachi uh, microprocessor. It's probably a sixteen bit. Because I believe that's what some of the other rolling gear I had was 16-bit processors. This chip over here is actually the ROM burnt for this unit that runs the actual OS on it. Uh, it contains basically the, the firmware that actually runs the, the unit itself. So it's interesting I chose a, a 40-pin dip for that even though there's this stranger slight footprint around it. So kind of odd, but uh, that's what that guy is anyway. Looking up some information regarding the ROM and the weird footprint I noticed on there. Uh, there was actually a change that was made at the 16th lot. So, looking here, the, it says EEPROM is mounted from the 1st to 15th lot, MASCROM is mounted from, to a main board in the 16th lot. So, they used to use, looks like, two EEPROMs, IC16, IC19, on the earlier units. Then later it went to the bigger 8 meg MASCROM, um, which is that 40 pin dip that's actually installed onto mine. So I didn't notice a lot number on my main board. I'll have to look again, see if I can find it on there. But I'm definitely that, that second or the after the 16th lot because I have the configuration in terms of IC20 being populated on the board. Um, over here, there's another chip that's connected to the cables running to the front uh, keyboard. So that's probably the key scan decoding for the front uh, of keyboard on the unit along with the rotary decoder. This is actually labeled as a gate array in the service manual, so it's probably some uh, early form of PAL or GAL. Directly above the processor, we have a, looks like Hitachi HM62864. That is a static RAM, most likely used alongside the main processor here. And then up above here, this looks like a DRAM, TC511664. I don't know it offhand, but if I had to guess, I would say that's a DRAM. Looks very similar to, to what, a, what a DRAM looks like. Um, package wise anyway so over on the left board is our DAC area and this is a really cool part of the board so I mentioned before that this unit has three separate outputs your stereo mix output then output one output two all stereo outputs so corresponding on the main board you have three sets of DACs these are NEC D63 200s they are 18-bit DACs uh, really good quality you've seen this DACs in a lot of other Roland gear they are pretty high spec wise in terms of, of when this unit was built, you know, and, and quality of DACs at the time, I'm sure these were not cheap. So it is kind of interesting and cool that they have all three in here. Uh, on the output of that, you obviously have our uh, required filtering through a handful of series op amps and then a couple, you know, banks capacitors here. Then that audio goes through this ribbon cable directly out to the back, you know, jacks on the jack board. So really, really cool that they have three uh, sets of DACs on this board couple last little notes about the main board here. Uh, here is your lithium battery for the memory backup uh, for your presets. So that is just a standard 3 volt CR2032. Nothing special. I mean, you just buy, you know, them cheap, a couple bucks a piece and replace it. So if you ever have this gear where it says, you know, battery low, battery dead, blah, 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 whatever, it is a trivial process to replace that battery. Don't think it's something complex. Most Roland gear that I've worked on has always had it socketed, so you don't need to do anything. You just pull the old battery out, put a new one in. Looking at some of the date codes on the chips in the sky to kind of give an idea of when this was made. Uh, 19th week, 95. 22nd week, 95. Uh, 95, 96 would be my guess for 
when my actual unit was made. So that puts about middle of the run in terms of the JB1080 series of, of these devices they made anyway. Again, I don't know any official counts or when they actually stopped production, but you know, they, they probably made a million of these things. While I'm in here, I'm just going to change out my battery anyway. I measured it. It's at 2.7 volts, so a little bit lower than I would like. So I'll just swap it out. So that was a quick little tour of the Roland Super JV, or the JV1080 as it's known. Um, again, I really wanted this to be a repair video. Unfortunately, the broken device I got worked and there's nothing wrong with it, so there's not too much I can do repair-wise with it. But I wanted to show the inside anyway, just with a couple little basic things that, that you know I would do if I, if I bought one of these and it was in worse condition than this one. I mean, I still may go through and replace capacitors just because, but... I'll see. I'm not going to videotape that. I mean, it's a single layered board and a handful of caps. There's really nothing to that. I mean, this would, this is really some of the easiest caps to replace in terms of, of a circuit board like this. Um, even on the main board, you know, there, there's not anything surface mount, you know, luckily, because the, the surface mount caps that Roland has used over the years has been, you know, they've been notorious for, for leaking and causing problems. Um, I went through that in my XP50 and a lot of other Roland gear, same thing. Uh, those that are, you know, have repaired or, or used um, test equipment, you know, with Tektronix or their TDS series of oscilloscopes, the exact same problem. The the capacitors leak all over the place, and you end up replacing hundreds of those things in, in those units just to get them working again. So, I also did mention that there is a handful of electrolytics, you know, on the on the main board here. And actually, I didn't even look at the brand of those. I can't see offhand. They're 85C rated as well. They're probably, yeah, they are Sanyos. So they're also Sanyos. So nothing special with those. I mean, if you really wanted to, you could probably go through and, and replace those with some high-quality Panasonic's or ELNA's or something like that, some audio rate caps. But, you know, again, there's nothing wrong with this. This section of the board typically doesn't get very hot. And there's a lot of air volume in here, too, being a 2U unit. So even though there's no external, you know, airflow events or fans or anything, it doesn't get overly hot in here, which extends the life of these units considerably because you know the heat isn't there and also you know with this power supply I didn't even mention I was looking at it it's it's a good design because they, they actually space the caps far away from the heat sinks you know a lot of times you'll find where the caps will be tucked right up next to the heat sink and they'll just get cooked away from the heat coming off of this but because these actually have you know a good amount of room behind them and I'd love to still see them all over here as much as possible but you know design criteria and placement of them to regulators may not have allowed that for the specific design all the little caps too, in terms of your smaller values, are ceramics. They're not tantalums, so the odds of those going bad via open or short is unlikely. These things are usually pretty robust, so there's not too much to do there. There's no internal fuses on this unit, so there's no fuse that could possibly be replaced. Uh, the MOV lives here. It, you know, in case of a big surge, that may be damaged. Uh, it'll be visibly cracked or, or burnt in that case, but nothing like that on this unit. So, yeah, again, I mean, these are rock solid units. There's not very much that goes wrong with them, so they're, they've been really, really reliable. You don't see too many of them with problems unless they've been abused. So anyway, hopefully this was interesting. Uh, sorry it wasn't a repair, but I've got plenty of other broken gear that I've got to go through here coming up that I'm going to be doing some videos on. So thanks for watching.